Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, for us as Italians, uh, tamburelli or computers don't, don't do any difference. We must be attached to our instruments in order to perform. Uh, so the instrument is, is this, our spirituality. The two things are combined together. Everything creates an organism. So tamburello, yesterday night, doesn't make any difference on the computer now. That's why I'm attached to it. I cannot be separated from my instrument. <laughs> now, uh, so this thing, this concept really is a thread that connects everything. Now, if you look at, up there, you see ht, uh, dash, dash, etc. That's my website. It's not important the fact that I have a website. What is important is that the all information, all the movie, exactly everything that I'm going to show you is available in this exact second in the website. So you can go there just uh, immediately and basically have exactly ev everything. Because everything that we are uh, building is in some way is a linkage system. It's a series of links that will allow us to grow. That is the whole idea. So, it's very important. So, you access my website through my uh, name, Antonino Saggio. You Google it, you jump into this place where uh, <coughs> this is not the first news. This is the first news. And, um, <coughs> and then, there is this little trick that is a gentleman trick. You don't show where the link of the lecture is. Only the people that are with us in this particular moment, know where is the secret link. There is a secret link. Otherwise, you cannot access the information. So you must know where each time I hide the link somewhere else. So only the people that are in this room in this moment know where is the secret link. <laughs> so the secret link is not Claire Folsom that I just lecture about ecology, uh, biosphere 2, etc. in Crete, but is in this wonderful image of another architect at the age of two years with his mother, and I found it fantastic image. He, he made a conference in Rome, and if you click everywhere, you don't go ev anywhere. Of course, you have to click in this specific point. <laughs> okay. In this eye, you will just you have to really find it. You will you will go to the um, to the actual conference. Okay. Now, I'm not in the internet right now, so I cannot. But you can try that. He works. So, <clears throat> what... Okay, that's another conference. What? Okay. Fine. Here we are. <clears throat> so, um, Mark and I are really buddies. Are really, I think we know each other quite well after several conferences. He's continuously asking me, well, give me the story. Uh, what are you going to show? And I said, Mark, this is, has to be a little covered for the simple reason that this is not really a formal, um, uh, a formal way to give you material, but in some ways a journey in the Mediterranean. So you don't, there is an element of surprise is very important. So that's why you don't know exactly what's going to happen. That's part of the game. So you have to allow me this hour of faith, let's say. So we'll do this, this trip, and uh, uh, the only way that I will call it is Three Mediterranean Inspirations. Actually, there is, there is a title, and I am a, one of the very, very lucky persons that was uh, uh, not only present in 2007, but also actually speak, uh, speaking. So for some friends that want to go back there, just click here, you can go to the whole conference. So, <clears throat> well... This title, in this particular moment, is not supposed to tell you anything, actually. It's also use of password. From the Truvian via Cave to UGL, oh my God, that's basically nothing. This guy is completely crazy. But at the end, you will understand how important via Cave is. I'm really discovering to many of you something that you never know. Uh, you have, surely you didn't know, um, the majority of you. And basically, UGL is not such a sexy thing, but it's nice for me to know. Uh, I'm working on that. So anyway, here is the Mediterranean. Um, and of course, we are in this peninsula in the middle of it. So we tend to think that we know something about the sea. But probably it's not true. But as an Italian, 
in particular as a person that is born in Rome from a Venetian mother and a Sicilian uh, uh, father, I, I tend to know that some pieces of this Mediterranean DNA is, is with us. So I think the first uh, concept that I really want to, uh, and then, I mean, for me, then I look at the Mediterranean from Rome. I'm not really considered that Rome necessarily must be the center, uh, and I don't particularly put it as an overall thing that all the roots end in Rome, but surely for me, that's true. <laughs> So Rome is an important part of our landscape. So the first concept, we need, unfortunately, to build some concepts during the thought. Otherwise, we get lost. We need to build some concepts. There are not too many, but some, they must be built. Otherwise, we cannot go uh, along. So th the first one that I really want to point to your attention is the concept of imprinting, which is very well known in the area of... Uh, uh, biology, zoology, etc. Everybody knows, or probably many of you have known, have read probably Cornet Lawrence, that will explain exactly as in the first moment of uh, an animal life, as well as our life, we create certain structures that in some way will uh, really allow us to grow, and in some way we always refer back to that moment. So the moment of our first years are really some type of, um, the word is really imprinting, is really that, that creates some structure, some dream, some mental landscape that will definitely uh, um, uh, structure our, uh, our life. Now, this is the concept of imprinting, uh, is very known in, in these sciences. I, uh, uh, some, of course, use this concept also to explain history or even economical history. I remember some passages of Karl Marx that today is not supposed to be even mentioned anymore. Uh, well, anyway, uh, that he really was referring to uh, some aspects of the Greek civilization with that concept of the imprinting for the old Western world. But anyway, putting Marx between parentheses, um, this, uh, what is this? This is, uh, this is Sindari. Alessandra, uh, 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 that's my father in Tindari uh, when they are there with this group of uh, intellectuals among which the Nobel Prize, uh, Salvatore Cosimo, we are in the 20s, and this place is one of the places of, of course, of the imprinting for whoever lives there. And then this is a, a little cadeau for you. Uh, this is again, is the Madonna Nera place that um, uh, yesterday we had all this. Okay, so this. Okay, this is our C. Now, uh, so this is the concept of imprinting. We bring into us that magic moment of our first year. Now, this concept um, is not a concept that only applies to the evolution of man or animals. Uh, it also applies to the history of civiliz civilization. In some way, there is an imprinting in the, uh, in the way that civilization grow, and particularly in the way that architecture manifests itself. So, this will bring you another action, the next action, is really that there is an imprinting in architecture, which is, uh, I think, um, well, uh, is something that if reveals useful, is fine, otherwise we discard, we just keep it for a few moments. But for me, it's a very important concept. So, from that point on, it will be very interesting to understand that this strange peninsula is rather different uh, in, in its, in its uh, not only geographically, it's dramatically different from the Alps to Sicily, but it's also culturally very different. And landscape and, and, uh, and the culture and geography all are combined together, and history, of course. So, this goes with a very simple idea, which is true, in, at least in my point of view, that the south of Italy, that was in some ways considered a Magna Grecia, architecturally wise, has really a very strong uh, uh, imprinting that goes around this world. Plastic, chiaroscuro, volumetric, and in some way we may refer this to, uh, to the Greek uh, uh, idea 
of building as in some way a sacro, a sacred act, a mean, a myth to the nature. So all this idea brings the idea that the architecture reveals itself by contrast with nature. Architecture is not nature. Architecture in some way sits on nature as a song to the, to the God. And this idea is very consistent. So that imprinting in some way is some, like a seed that can be cultivated generation after generation, variation after variation. But there is always that myth of that beginning moment of our architectural uh, civilization there. And there is only one architect, or no, two architects with me. Of course, uh, there is Margaret and Liam. Uh, and uh, just to, 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 to them, I will tell that in this case, gain the elevation. The elevation is the key instrument of the work. So for this way of thinking, chiaroscuro, uh, uh, um, context with nature, etc., is the elevation that wins as a way of conceiving architecture. That idea goes on and on. This is a very famous uh, 1930 uh, uh, villa in Capri by Libera. I'm combining images just to put you in that, in that idea. Really the idea that the volume in some way it's like a meme, it's like a song, it's like a poem to the natural, and goes by contrast. And just before coming here, I am with this very close friend that I, I love that uh, when you come in Sicily, I will uh, introduce you. He's a very nice person, it's called Antonio Presti, and he's uh, a mechanist of art around Sicily. He makes big uh, 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 objects in the landscape. I just was uh, there uh, two weeks ago to, to, to celebrate his pyramid that he just built. Um, it's a huge object. I participated from the very first moment to the realization of this object. I went there with the motorcycle. At that time, unfortunately, I fell down from the motorcycle. I was completely lost in the middle of there. So luckily, uh, it's impossible to uh, uh, put up the motorcycle again. So I asked Antonio and the other friends that came to pick me up at 9 in the evening after the sunset. So we must have some adventure, but also the, the, the other day I went again to the pyramid because evidently I had made something wrong. And so I, I stopped the motorcycle like uh, two kilometers before and then I, wa I went walking. So Catherine, uh, Christine, when we go there, we must be sure to go walking and not too close to it. Okay, Christine. Now, here is another thing. If the salt is plastic, elevation, and in some way this kind of song to the, or poem to the nature, well, the north of Italy is completely different. It's really a military action that you do on the landscape you really conquer uh, the, 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 the place, you create your fortification there, you are Carlo de Cumanus, you create your thing, and then from that, a city evolves. But the imprinting is really always that type of uh, first action, in this case, completely opposite of the Greek one. In this case, it's really the idea of the military camp, the, that uh, areas of action, and then from that, many northern cities develop from a military camp, like Como, that of course I know very much because I study uh, Terrani a lot. So, here's the military camp, etc. And in certain type of architecture, even of today, you still feel that, you know? You feel that imprinting moment of the rationality of, and, and also the, the force and the military strength of, of that uh, action. And of course, Wherever metaphysica can go, uh, go, go on, or whenever else an architect as, as Aldo Rossi could grow. Surely we grow within this milieu, within this environment, within this uh, context. And of course, a plan wins. Is the plan, the rationality of plan that wins in this case. The center of Italy is a completely different story. Again, completely different. He has not that military Roman attitude on the north. He doesn't have that Greek uh, uh, attitude, the plastic Greek attitude on the south, but has a completely different story, and is the story that comes from the Etruscan 
and we are approaching the center of my first part of the first talk. The Etruscan is completely different culture. Probably they are coming from the last information and studies. Probably they were coming from close to the east, uh, uh, close to Constantinople, from an, an island uh, uh, up uh, down there, and then anyway arrived to, to to the central Italy, and from there developed a very interesting new culture, combining with local people. What is the magic of, of the Etruscan is that their action is a sectional action. It's always dealing with landscape, always dealing with nature, always dealing with the natural formation of forces, which is completely opposite to, uh, to the Roman. That's why I continue to say that Roman is not a Roman city at all. Uh, 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 other parts of, of Italy and of Europe are Roman, but not Rome. Rome has this, that Etruscan hurt in its, in its, uh, in its own uh, uh, history, in printing. Really, Rome as a city is a city where nature, <coughs> section, archaeology, fragmentation lives in an environment that is really, really rare, rather, rather unique. So, um, really, uh, this is a very important point. The section wins, the section as an action, an architectural action to relate layers and to relate uh, the artifacts with nature. The moment is the moment of excavation, it's not the moment of filing up. So, we end the introduction. Now, let's go to this mystery, something that I'm sure you don't know. <laughs> well, with my students, I always said, I made this game, be very, very precise and very attentive when you discover a black hole. What is a black hole? It's very simple. I can talk sometimes, and I can talk of Frank Lloyd Wright. And the student may have no idea who Frank Lloyd Wright is. If that is the case, that becomes a black hole has to become a black hole in his mind that, from the context, he has to understand how important flat that is, and uh, he's the only guy that doesn't know. So he has to, the way to act with the black hole is pretend that you know everything about the black hole. Uh, oh yes, Frank right, yes, yes. But when you go home, you go and study it, otherwise you are an, an idiota. Right? That's the game. <laughs> so, when I gave a lecture in Milano, this is exactly happened like that, I made a very articulated lecture about Etruscan. Then this assistant of the main professor came to me and said, mm, all right, but do you know the Pietave? And I said, yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, within myself, I know, oh my God, that's the black hole. I don't know the Pietave. I don't know what he's talking about. But from the context, that should be something very important. So I started to study it, and I became pretty much a paranoid about Vietave, which is one of the most wonderful things that you can uh, encounter, and nobody knows. Why? Because they are censored. Very simple. From the uh, official archaeology, they are hidden, for many reasons that I will explain you in one second. So, in the northern part of Rome, of course, is volcanic region. Well, basically all Italy, large part of Italy is volcanic, but we have lots of volcanoes close to Rome too, although they are not active. So the territory is created by these volcanoes. And uh, there are three lakes on a row. The third one on the north part, the third one is the Lago of Bolsena. Close by, you will find this type of landscape. Now, in this type of landscape, uh, if you look at this, okay, yes, yeah, well, well that is surely a... Uh, uh, um, a, a first town that in some way smell Etruscan, almost all of them are of Etruscan origin, and you can see all this greenery, you see the landscape, but then you uh, are kind of surprised about this kind of cracks. On the, on, on, it's very difficult that you understand looking at the aerial picture, but there is something strange. There are these cracks very close to the downtown, what they are. What are they? These are exactly the Via Cave. The Via Cave means uh, empty streets. Okay? They are called Via Cave. Empty Cave means excavated. Excavated streets. And there are many around it. And then I, have the, I found this person that is called Giovanni Feo. 
that studied them for all his life. So uh, I read all his book. It's kind of a little local hero for me. So, because he's a lo- little local hero for the simple reason that he is not an academician, he's out of the system, he spent all his life in this thing, he's kind of removed by the, by the official thing. But he really uh, spent his life in understanding what these things are. And then I'm going to explain to you. So, what they are, are real excavation in the real tooth of stone, a can go on for... 500, up to 500, 600 meters. And generally, they go from a lower level to a upper level, some type of plateau. They, uh, and they are an incredible thing, and there are many around the same area. So, the archaeologists, the archaeologists have built power as many other things. So, basically, there is a very clear hierarchy in how archaeology deals with, 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 uh, with the past. First of all is Greek. Greek is very important. You got immediately a share if you, if you are able to find something Greek. Then it is, uh, of course, Roman. Then there are all the other civilizations, basically. So, the Etruscans are secondary in a type of hierarchy. The second level of hierarchy is that they are interested in objects Painting object art, um, architecture, but not in system like geographical system, ancient roots, uh, uh, all the, the thing that really creates uh, a, 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 a series of relationship. So these Diecave were completely neglected. Nobody really studied them. Uh, so we have to wait. And then if you ask around in Italy you will see that nobody knows. Very few people know. Federica, you have any idea about that? I knew that it was just... Yeah, because you live there. But anyway, generally, uh, generally, okay. All right, if you grew up there, you know. But otherwise, you don't. So it was not a good test. But anyway, believe me, believe me, believe me. Okay, so anyway. Okay. Okay, now, the, the thing is the following. Um, so these are censored, uh, censored, no? Censurate. Censurate. Why? Who said why? You understand why in a second. <laughs> okay, now we, no, you, no, you will really understand that, uh, uh, Triti. There is a real profound why, but I will arrive in a, in a little time. So we can see some of them. Well, I don't know. I thought about David Bowie arriving here from Mars. I don't know if he's a good choice. But anyway... Just to give you a feeling of what these places are, these are rough, very rough videos, but uh, in my, from my point of view, make all the difference because uh, you, I can share a feeling with you. So you see how long they are, and, and the other very interesting thing is that if there is one close to the other, so there are many. So the only thing that the archaeologists said, well, these are streets that need to go, or they are parts of that old street or whatever, which doesn't make completely no sense, because they are not streets as we uh, uh, imagine. They are not functional streets at all. What are they? Okay. What are they? Okay. Let's try to understand first one concept. Another little construction here. The concept is that for this uh, ancient civilization, basically all of them, uh, the places have some type of magic, sacred meaning. You don't build in any place like this. You build because there are profound reasons to build that. Particularly if you have to build temples. And so there are inner forces, or there are sun, or there are triangulation. There are reasons why you do uh, such a thing. You don't build a necropolis in any place, you know. You don't build a, a, a new town and a temple, temple like that in any place. So there is something that is called geografia sacra, as a way, as a branch of, uh, well, a mixed branch that really explains these things. So this is the first concept that you understand. The second concept is the most interesting one. Look at this. 
these are Coppelle, technically thinking. So, what, surely the explanation of what these trees are, are related to this. So, the most logical explanation, and the most possible explanation, is that these trees are processional roots. Are processional roots that was do doing in a complex series of ceremonies that will bring the death to his uh, uh, rupestre uh, um, uh, sepelimento, his thumb in, in the in the uh, in the burial in the uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in the in the land. Uh, uh, so there is a series of procession action. This is what is the, the explanation, and so this procession action was really very articulated. Many of them. Uh, are strictly related with the water. The water is the most viable, uh, 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 precious uh, good, and is a good that the dead need. The, the dead not only needs the, 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 the dresses or, you know, its uh, weapons, it also needs water. That's why there is uh, this, all this coppella around, so the dead can uh, drink. So anyway, um, this is, the, uh, I read uh, pretty much about this, and this seems to me the most uh, um, uh, probable and logical explanation, particularly because there are so many close one to the other, because otherwise it's completely illogical. So I wrote this thing in Italian, and um, um, I will translate in English, I think it is better like that, because anyway, I will do any mistakes any case, so oral is nicer than, than in written. So, nel mondo etrusco, in the, in the Etruscan world, exists a complex strategy of excavation. It is a strategy that is combined in the rupestre tomba, that means in the tomb in the stone, to the dronos, that is another uh, uh, object in this uh, strategy, to the vie cave, and uh, to the, what is called there between parentheses, to the excavation that they do in the plateau, because the water can go up and then go in the streets, etc. So this processional series of excavation is that one that accompany the death to the uh, engraving, and at the same time celebrates the path of the water. Le vie cave, the vie cave have been completely forgotten by uh, uh, official archaeology, at least for three order of motifs. The first one because they are Etruscan. The second one, because uh, uh, um, uh, they are not objects. And the third one, and then I really go to answer your question, 3T, is that because they are an ecological system. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You cannot understand a via cave if you take it separately. In order to understand what's going on, you have to understand lots of things simultaneously. You have to understand why, for the Etruscan, the key thing of everything was that the mother head was alive. That is the main concept. For them, the, the herd is alive, is a, is a being. So everything is related to that. Since the herd is a being and is a living uh, organism, then you act in every possible respect to that idea in mind. So the whole idea that the earth is a living being is something that is being completely erased by the next culture. Basically, all the, the, the other culture have been really built exactly on the opposite, that there is dead mother, even the animal don't have any soul. So, you, you understand that in order to tackle this issue, you must have a systematic thinking and an ecological thinking. So, you have to put things together. Otherwise, you will not understand what's going on. Another very interesting thing between parentheses is this thing. is For that um, uh, culture, that is our imprinting. This is the place that I'm trying to say. It's our real imprinting. Is really the idea that there are, not the idea, the fact that nature holds an incredible amount of information and are information that are completely hidden by next culture. 
So, for that, cult- for that culture, um, a stone falling means something, and uh, a wind coming from one side means something, because it really talks. It really talks. So, uh, if the earth is a living being, it talks. It tells us things. It tells us where to build. It tells us how to act. It tells us a lot of things. And this is a very, very famous uh, 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 piece of, of Etruscan... Uh, it's, a, it's an Etruscan instrument. It was needed to really understand those things. It's a piece of lever. Here is another thing. Now, we have to do a jump of 3,000 years to see how certain concepts that are coming from this can um, help shaping uh, teaching and action in the real architecture. Uh, originally, I didn't want to do that. I really only wanted to do this. But uh, with the dialogue with Mark, I really understand that at the end, uh, I think it's important that the audience feel how these ideas will transfer to architecture. So I will show some architecture. So, it's four years that we are working on this idea. And the idea involves uh, PhD students, graduate students, um, normal undergraduate students, and uh, a group of architects, around 10, that are part of this little uh, group that I created that is called Nitrosaggio. What is the idea? And the idea piled up uh, years after years. It didn't immediately came up. Uh, it really took a lot of time. Well, um, what is this? This is um, five coordinated actions that we want to do in Rome and we are proposing for the city of Rome. The actions can be seen from many different points at, at the same time. To, to put it very, very simply at the beginning, <coughs> you have to imagine that we are tackling one of the most important crises of the city of Rome, that is, of course, transport, transportability, you know, the way to circulate. So, what we are created are five con- concentrated actions that deals with that issue and connects particularly horizontally and not vertically like that, the downtown is here, two parts of the city, we are talking about um, around 200,000 inhabitants more or less here, and they connect certain very large green areas, this one and particularly this one that is the Park Archaeological de Latvia. Well, when I designed this uh, ring, I really understood that it was possible to design it. And I lived with it for probably, I don't know, one month. Then another person came to me and he said, um, and you know, yes, yes, you're doing that thing. You know about this person that has this mania of making a charm. My God, I didn't think. I thought only on a kind of urban green way. I didn't think that the charm could run into it. So, it came just to tell you what is the truth of, of a creative process. It's not that you know everything. You are searching, and you are using the link. So, this is, at the same time, is a new tramway that we are proposing. From a city planning point of view, it's extremely important because you create horizontal actions. I don't go on that from the city planning point of view. So, but, so you are creating a, 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 a tram, at the same time, the tram contains a series of functions. This is a typical thing. It's not that the infrastructure is needed only to do one thing. The ancient Aurelian walls was needed for making many things, not only defense, many other actions. The idea of functionality, multifunctionality is very important. The idea of systematic green is extremely important when you act in a city, so that means that you can have different system of continuity of green species, of green animals, etc. No type of ecological, uh, ecological is not the right word in this context, environmental uh, wise and intelligent techniques. Then you have information, what we call in our jargon, information technology form, that means uh, uh, that we really believe that what makes a change today is a real intelligent and creative capability to incorporate within the system information technology. And we mean by information technology, uh, the technology itself, 
uh, and also the way to think about the design. The fourth pro process is that one of the living accessibility, which is a very important issue that in some way deals with the idea, a little bit similar to slow food, that in some way you can use the city at different uh, uh, speeds. In some cases, it's nice to have a little lower speed. So that is the concept of living accessibility, and you gain a tremendous uh, in this process. Same thing that sometimes we want to go by bicycle or by, by, by foot. You know, we know what we gain by doing that. And the thing, the number five, is the magic crisis. Magic crisis means for us the incredible capability that, oh, so, sorry, that only art, architecture, and other things add to put together things in a way that is completely unexpected before. It's really the synergetic aspect. Of, of, of the art. Art is, and creative thinking is not just piling up things, that is another story, it's putting ingredients together in a way that is completely unexpected before. So the magic crisis for us is one category that is crucial. So we've done, you see all those dots? In each one of those dots, there are at least three to five projects that have been accumulating during the years. And, um, and along this, that is called the Urban Green Line, each part of the Urban Green Line has a number and has a specific uh, post in a blog. So everything is interrelated, and the projects that are developed there are, of course, open to all the other participants and to the, to the, to the city and whoever is interested can understand what is in our kitchen. So we made several projects and we created images that help us. I'll show you only one project, because at the end you have to understand also, I believe, what these architects actually do, and what are the process that simulate an architectural thinking. That is, you know, it is a thinking, it is a thinking, that's the important thing, it's a thinking. So it can be good, bad, deep, not deep, but it's a thinking, or it's supposed to be a thinking. So, what's happening is that, working and working and working, we discovered that along the, in this part existed already an excavation done by Mussolini because he wanted to create a diagonal line and nothing happened there. So it was completely abandoned. A student of mine really discovered that, that part, the abandoned ferrovia here. So we inserted in the old, in the old um, anello, in the old ring, and then we developed a project. So I'll show you very, very briefly, very briefly, there are only few drawings. Actually, everything it is linked. So if you go there, you can see the in, in, entire, in, entire thesis. Now we cannot, because we are not in the Internet. I just picked some, uh, some images. So what's going on is, well, well, um, Information technology for us is also a way to think about uh, relationship and a um, way of conceiving architectural form uh, that is um, rather different than what we used to do. So this is a whole approach that follows the paradigm of automated uh, seller. There is a, uh, this technology that has been very developed in, in city planning that is called automatic seller. That means our processes, that in some, in, in some way they will show how a certain form emerged, like a kind of swarm behavior or something like that. So the student was fascinated by that, so he jumped into this technology, do that, that transformation, boom, 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 boom. And then at a certain moment he came out with this, that is a very nice uh, um, concept. Is the, that, is a, that is an excavation, and of course, with our imprinting, as soon as I see excavation, I can become very excited about it. Anyway, since it was a, 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 an underground that was uh, mm, already sinking the ground, that makes sense. So what he did, basically out of this form, he created a series of performation and vaults of what? Okay, uh, the same structure, sorry, allows also a kind of organization of the park uh, uh, on the uh, higher level. So you organize a way to create 
certain type of structure, how it can be bridged from one side on the other, and basically below, this is what's going on. So, that excavation became all this game of, 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 of caves and things, and what is the function? This is, at the same time, the urban green line that arrives there as a normal tram stop, because it's a real thing, but at the same time, we, uh, <coughs> we propose for this particular area uh, <coughs> um, uh, a museum of tram in Rome. Because tram, you see, was extremely important in Rome before Mussolini. was the city in Euro Europe that was more developed in terms of tram. Because we didn't have subway, that, uh, that's one reason. And the other time, because it was a kind of, some type of leftist uh, 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 feeling about the, the, the public transportation. So Mussolini basically eradicated the tram system from the city. He wanted to have tanks going around the city. That's why he, he basically opened up the streets, eliminated trams and all that. So, but there is a story behind. There is a story behind. So, okay. Uh, so these are some images and things, these are the variations, so we have our jargon and everything, of course, but in this particular context, I, I'll go on the substance. All right? Next, next is called Digital Caravaggio, or Discoveries of Tracks. Okay. I think you can follow me for, probably I'll not do the whole thing, but I, I feel that you are pretty happy about this. <laughs> okay, now... Digital Caravaggio, I made this just in order to help you to locate the thing. So, um, Caravaggio actually was born in Milano. It's not true that he was born in Caravaggio. Caravaggio is a very little town, although he immediately moved. Very probably went to Venice, Florence, and then finally Rome, when he stayed around 10, 15 years. Then, as you know, he killed one person uh, to escape to Naples, to Messina where he stayed, then he went to Valletta in Malta, came back in Sicily, then he went back in, 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 in Naples, and then he finally died to Porto Ercole, again where Federica, very close to Federica is, right? Okay. Now, this is uh, just to uh, picture you a little bit his movement, um, I could do a <coughs> kind of a normal lecture to show what Caravaggio did in Rome, what Caravaggio did in Naples, what he did in Valletta. You can do that by yourself. You don't need it. So I decided to give you something more interesting. Actually, if you want to uh, go and look at this movie, because he arrived to 32, so I'm very proud of this, because I didn't gain a single penny out of that. But it's a, it's a movie that, uh, in some way, had a lot of its own success. Nobody knows that I did it, but if you go, uh, it will be fine. I wrote this book for these particular days. Uh, you can uh, download it for free. So it's in English. I, just for the days of the conference, whoever is interested can download the, the book for free, or, of course, uh, order in print. Now, I'm not even talking about the book. I really want much farther and showing something more complex. And so, the lecture of Caravaggio, of course, I would love to do it. And um, there are so many uh, things about it, but I don't think that I will have more than 20 minutes. That's correct, Mark? Well, we negotiate around, around. <laughs> we'll negotiate. <laughs> well, anyway. <clears throat> Yeah. So anyway, uh, very, very briefly, before going to the center, very, very briefly, my, all my approach of Caravaggio is that one that Mark said at the beginning, is that idea that the instrument is a crisis, actually, for an artist. It's not something that solves its problem. It's a complete challenge all the time. And this is the thing that I think the musicians know best than everybody else. Um, now, uh, the camera oscura, it's been very known that Caravaggio used uh, before the mirror and later the camera oscura. What the book shows or try to show is really why he had to completely change his vision in order to really understand what this new tool, this new instrument really revealed to, to humanity. Is the, the moment, for example, of 
that everything acts as a theatrical action. It breaks every profundity there. It's like everything happening on a stage. It's happening on a stage, you always close windows. It's one thing that was the typical uh, uh, way of, of Renaissance art to conceive art was through the window. And instead Caravaggio completely creates uh, the opposite of that. He pushes his, his actor on the, sta- on, the, on the scene, actually even outside the scene, and he puts a blank wall behind. Uh, and that is uh, also another reason of that. Then there is this other thing that in Italian is very nice, in Bilico, has been translated in precarious balance. I don't know if it makes the beauty of the word in Bilico. That means that basically in, in his painting, everything it is like there for one second. It will change position, you know. It's kind of very precarious equilibrium. The light, everybody talks about the light. But talking about the light of Caravaggio means you don't understand cause between effect. You make a confusion. He needs that light. He needs the light as a flash because he's interested really in the capture of the second. So it's not that he likes the light like like that per se. He really needs the light of a flash because it's only the light of a flash that will capture that particular second of a precarious equilibrium, which is life, actually, as we know. So this is what about, and then about lenses, and now is what uh, I, will, uh, I will describe to you. The, uh, the only person that I share this, um, uh, this point of view is John Allen, that we, we discussed uh, uh, by mail about that. And actually, these are the images that I sent it to him, I think it was six months ago or something. Well, this, 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 it is this idea of Caravaggio Digital. What does it mean? Well, it means that in the history of art, particularly look at the Byzantine time, was the old body that was engaged in the vision. is the old power of whatever it is, either a religious power or a sanctity or whatever, is encaptured, empowered in the old body. It's the old body that makes it. And uh, that is typical of, the, of, of that art. Then when Giotto arrives, we start to change a little bit that, that the, the, the man didn't become an icon, he's a real man acting with his whole body with other men. And so it's, it's a little bit different, but still is the man in his in, entirely uh, uh, that do that. The same thing for Piero della Francesca. So this is kind of a something that Caravaggio kept in mind all the time. You know, the masters are really something that you cannot escape. So, surely Caravaggio knows very well Michelangelo. Surely Caravaggio knows extremely well this painting on the, cha- on the Sistine Chapel. What we see here is that the body of man is part of the universe. So, the same strength of the universe go in the body of the man, go in God, and they will transfer each other. But it's the universe, the strength of the universe that we feel. Now, Caravaggio is incredible. It's completely different than that. Caravaggio makes a, revol- a, a, a revolution because it's really the digit. It's really the, the finger. In English, you have digit and finger as the same word? Yes. Okay. So it's really the finger in which the power of the man goes. Everything else is either hidden behind or is not really relevant. The whole action goes in the digit. So Christ called Matteo, and Matteo says, again with the digit, that's me, and all the movement of the other person are absolutely uh, uh, crucial on that respect. So that idea is one of the aspects of the incredible modernity of Caravaggio. Because it's exactly the modern man that in some way can as instruments that can be even destroyed the world, it can be activated by our digit or our, our finger. While for the old ancient man or the, the Neanderthal or pre-Neanderthal man, the poor guy needs, a <laughs> well, some other type of instrument. But the modern man can act on reality just with the touch of a finger. And it's incredible this, I think. There is another painting in which this is even higher which is this incredible painting, 
that is the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus is uh, uh, half dead, he's definitely dead, there is no doubt about it, look at the hand. And at the same time, he's becoming alive in that specific second in which Christ uh, showed, uh, showed that. So, really, that is capturing all these things. And I think it is nice, you know, instead of giving you a recap of the, of the, of the book that you can read if you want, just to have another chapter that is not in the book. <laughs> Then when I was looking at the pyramid, I met, I met this uh, Afghanistan uh, photographer, great guy, De- Degasi Reza. He was the star, he was one of the course. And uh, um, so they gave him uh, Caravaggio books to him. And he was looking very, yeah, well, they are cadeaux. So. But he said something, one thing very interesting. So that's why I, I, I'm kind of paranoid about credits, as you know this. And uh, um, he said... Hmm, Caravaggio is really digital. I said, well, really these emails with, to John are not private at all, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, what he meant was that uh, the range of colors that uh, uh, Caravaggio was capturing was not possible to capture with a normal film. So with a normal traditional film, he was noticing it's not possible to capture that range of colors. So Caravaggio for him is digital in a completely different way than the way that I was thinking, but the two things mix quite well. So it's a little cadeau. Then another one, we always work in teams. We really work as a kind of ecology, me and my students. So basically when I put some ideas on the ground, in, in some case activate thinking, in other case don't activate any thinking. But for example, after a while, um, the student of mine sent me this picture, and this is Mario Schipano, that is a quite well-known Italian uh, uh, painter, died uh, two or four years ago, and he was very, very, very interested of, about media and television, particularly, as uh, he, he envisioned the disaster that uh, happened to Italian society <laughs> exactly because of television since the 60s. So this, I think, is a nice... Uh, uh, image that, uh, because he, you know, he found that. He found that, he sent it to me, and we are seeing it because it's part of a process. So that's, so it's, of course, is uh, the digit uh, with the energy from the computer back and forth. Now, another very interesting part about Caravaggio is this idea how everything is generated from the bottom, from the bottom up. Caravaggio is really a heretic uh, painter, as well as Borromini is an heretic painter, an architect, which is the notation that John did immediately when we were together, not with the motorcycle inside it, but close by. So he exactly said, this guy is heretic, he's changing everything. He, that was his first ob- observation, because everything is generated bottom up. That's the idea. And same thing happened here. Everything is generating bottom-up. Uh, from the dirty food to the Madonna, which is uh, more than a Madonna, it's, a, it's more and less of a Madonna at the same time, is, a, is an Italian woman. Uh, so everything, these forces that are generated from the bottom are crucial forces to understand what, um, what happens in this moment in history. And it's the last moment in which Italy really... Uh, 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 gave a contribution to humanity. It's really the moment of the beginning of, uh, of 17th century with the invention of telescope. The invention of telescope is the first time that the man can look at the stars from bottom up. That means from trying to understand what are the real rules, the mathematical rules, the physics rules, and not waiting as God telling us what they are. So this is a very important moment. It's a moment of revolution of thinking that goes in science, architecture, and art. So we created a museum about Borromini and fantastic architecture, but I'm not going to talk about that. I want to talk about the crack. That is another figure of Caravaggio. The crack that reveals another world, that hides something. And uh, uh, so with this idea of the crack, we worked a lot and, for example, 
I was with the director of the October Gallery to see the, the, the Tate uh, uh, exhibition of Salcedo. When we were there, we had no idea that was, uh, that was an installation. We just discovered after a while this track. And after five minutes, we understand the power of that track. We even been there inside as much as we can. Because the crack is something that has an incredible strength. So, these students of mine are working on that idea, and they are putting together Caravaggio, Fontana, Doris Salcedo, etc., to do a project in Rome. I describe it very quickly. Um, well, again, crisis for us is very important. What's going on? These are the Aurelian Wall, and this is um, San Giovanni. The, 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 the metro goes there. And of course, when the metro goes, everything is getting excavated. Now, the new tendency in Rome is that when you find excavation, before you stop everything. That's why you never... Uh, anything. Now, what they do, they discover things, they take pictures, kind of, and then they go on, and then put it back in. Um, well, basically... Our idea, our thinking, our proposal that is a cultural, architectural, artistic proposal at the same time is that you can live with these things and you can generate normal and modern urban projects around their archaeology. So archaeology is not something like a museum, but it's something that can be part of a cycle within a modern city, particularly if it is close to the infrastructure. So what we see here, these are all the layers that are accumulated in this, in this area. By the way, this is Via Sannio, just to no, check. So this is Via Sannio. And this is also the, the reorganization of Via Sannio at the same time of the market. So it's exactly where I just up you. So these are uh, complex, mature architectural projects. Uh, there are machines that work and need a lot of time to have a machine that works. So, as you can see, the moment of the section is very important. You see different layers. There is a higher level over here that is this level, that is the level of Basilica, and it's possible to go up and you feel the Aurelian wall in this particular way coming close to it. And then there is a series of other spaces, articulation, double level, and lots of things that I don't have the time to, to explain. What will be interested, probably you understand, is that the existing level is this one. Okay? So, everybody was always talking about these huge Aurelian walls. But if you see there, they are not huge at all. The thing is that, of course, it's very simple, is that in centuries and centuries, Earth has been accumulated. The real uh, height of the Aurelian Wall is this one. So that's why with this project, you can uh, actually see the other levels that have been buried for, for years and years. So it's all complex experience and lots, lots of work. Um, uh, what we all, always do, because I am also a little bit of a pragmatic American uh, education as a faculty, was that one to have a kind of rough calculation about cost. I still remember the first time that I arrived in America, my professor said, all right, how big it is, uh, how, what density you have, and how much does it cost? Uh, being educated in Italy, that is completely out of our <laughs> abstract way of thinking. So I, I ask my students to do that rough calculation. Doesn't take a long time, you know. It's uh, trivial, but you know, you know how much square footage you're doing, how much does it cost, and then you under and that is a political action because they understand how much the, the project would have cost instead of all that wasted money here and there. So it's very important. So. These are all cost calculation. And the other very interesting sub-story is, I don't know if the Ecotechnics group will ever met in the theater of all possibility, means here in Biasagno, I don't know if you know, uh -huh, there is a theater there. Uh, yes, yes, there is a theater that is called Teatro Lo Spazio, that is seated in the Aurelian Wall at the end of Biasagno, in that area. So since my students need to have also a client, in order to have a real contact, 
Within this project, there is a, what we call a mixité project. So there is archaeology, there is a campus of archaeology, there is the, the reorganization of the market of the Asagno, there is the infrastructure of the, of the subway, etc. There is also this theater, because actually there is a theater there. And uh, so I found it uh, very interesting to show you that how this thing that is so important for for, uh, for the old people of, of ecotechnics, and then I'm coming very slowly into that. It's such an important force, and we we'll try to incorporate in our project. All right, Mark, there is Van Gogh. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> Two minutes or five? Or just go? Just one minute. Two minutes. Two minutes, Van Gogh. All right. Okay, so these are the cracks, those ab about the cracks. And uh, uh, this is our gallery in Rome, because our group um, is, is, um, acts a little bit, uh, not a little bit, it, it acts, tend to act as a group, you know, like the, the Murano glass uh, maker. So, um, uh, one person had the incredible courage uh, to, uh, that's called Rosetta Angelini, to really not only design this and build this, uh, this gallery in very close to the station, but even to run, which is even, you know, a completely craziness. But uh, the, the gallery is still there. We are really working on it to, to keep it alive because it's like a dream. And in fact, it's called Galleria Come Se. What if, you know, how the, the world is it like that? Unfortunately, probably it's not like that, but here it is like that. So, the Galleria Come Se is based on the crack, as you have seen, and um, this is uh, one of our typical show that is uh, lots to, to share with information technology, as you understand, but we... Uh, okay, then there is another story. Just close to the gallery, right now, there is uh, this other project that goes on. This, all, this is the gallery that you just saw, just next door, for incredible reasons that I cannot explain. There is an organization that takes care of children arriving in, in Italy with boat or under a chance for everything. So the, this organization become friend with, uh, with Rosetta next by, and incredibly in the such corrupted uh, places like Italy, uh, she was able to have the, um, the job, and uh, we collaborated a little bit on that, and this is uh, the building site. So it's actually happening now, and we will be finishing one month. So we are expanding a little bit. Now, uh, this is one of the first shows that we did. And this is Francesco Rimondi. Yay! It's a little homage to our uh, Fran Francesco, uh, Cesco, and Molly, that are our hosts, I don't know where they are. And uh, Cesco had the courage to, to believe that all this craziness, since I was also part of Expo Technics, I am a little strange, but there is something interesting there. So he gave me faith. He took his car he, and, and, and Molly, and without knowing very much, he arrived, uh, arrived, it's exactly like that. He arrived there and he mounted this fantastic, beautiful show that was uh, probably the second that we had, or the third, we are just at the beginning, and was uh, really, really super. Unfortunately, we are not uh, uh, too strong into the uh, art market, so it was, uh, but it's an enterprise that I am very fond of. So we made a book about a lot of things, and this is a, a complete article on, on Francesco, Francesco Rimondi. So if you want, you can read. And this is the book. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. But, okay, uh, the article is not written by me, but it is written by a person of my group. It's a very good article. And... Uh, uh, so, if you want to know more of the things that you see around, because the first time you don't understand what's going on. Um, okay, uh, the last minute will go to, to Van Gogh. And to make you sweet, uh, I brought you a copy of the book just for you, Mark. Just for you. And, uh, uh, well, he's the chief of Van Gogh. is the chief of this northern man. A man from the north, I mean, you know Holland. Holland is a pretty disaster climatically. It's a really a nightmare. So you have to imagine this man from the north that has always been around there, the Hague, the Dead, London, Paris, Laia, uh, 
<laughs> and then the, the boring eyes, uh, um, then he arrived to Paris, and then he made this incredible jump, arriving to the Mediterranean. That was, uh, you know, like for us, arriving to the moon. It's really different. Everything is different. And um, I wanted to just spend the last 30 seconds on, 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 uh, on his arriving to Saint Marie de la Mer. Because Saint Marie de la Mer, flash, flash, Saint Marie de la Mer is a magic place. And uh, it's a little bit, it's a, still a little uh, place, I think, on, and he stayed there for a week. It's the only moment that Van Gogh actually seen the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. You know, in all his life, he saw seven days. And he painted this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this painting among which um, surely there are at least two masterpieces, which are this one and particularly this one that I cannot really lecture on that. And, um, and these are the famous gypsies. Because uh, Saint Marie de la Mer is known by the people that know uh, that is another magic place of Europe. Because in Europe there are the gypsies too. And although being cancelled by different domination and things like that, they are still exist. So all the gypsies go to Saint Marie de la Mer and uh, is close by and is a very interesting coincidence that you know, Van Gogh and, uh, was in the same place, and this is one of these paintings of the gypsies. Okay, now this painting here, and I'm finished. This is, I saw it with, I saw it with John Allen and Sergio, uh, and Sergio Procic, I guess unfortunately he's not here this time, but uh, in San Paolo. This is a painting that is really full of mysteries and of secrets, really. So, all, the, all this book is about uh, a Van Gogh that I know very well because uh, it's one of those passions that you cultivated all, all your life. I start to read all the letters of Van Gogh in 1970, which is something of caring, like 45 years ago. or No, 35 years ago or so. Uh, so I pretty know what I'm talking about. Um, and so the book shows... Uh, certain hidden uh, details that only if you really are into it, you understand and you recreate. You need another like, ecology in order to understand. You have to understand the painter, the human being, his hidden uh, problems, what he actually wrote, what he painted, what he didn't paint, as a system that are all together. If you don't understand that, you don't understand uh, what's going on. But what is the most important... Ah, actually, I put this uh, only for my colleagues from academia uh, to tell you that I'm also kind of a serious uh, person sometimes. And I, this is my book of architecture, or history of architecture, 500 pages, in which proudly there is the... For the first time in an history of architecture, there is the history of Biosphere 2. So that has an impact for the followers about, about this. But anyway... What is the big, big lesson about Van Gogh for me is really this. I, one in my life I discovered. It really goes with the truth here. It's really this capability that I think we have to develop to keep all our layers of our life together. So, I was loving Van Gogh at the age of 17. I still love it. I have my age of 17 that coexists with my age of 56. And I think if we can struggle to live, to live with our desires and our, what we were, what we wanted to be, and what we are, is really something great. This is what I get from.